Greetings. Hey, thanks for joining us here on the Business of Agriculture podcast. It's me, Damian Mason, your host. Got a great show for you today. We're talking about corn, soybeans, grain, outlook, and the USDA report. Here we are recording this uh, in mid-August, but we're going to talk about what it means for us long term, what it means long haul. We're also going to talk about the huge weather event that just happened one week ago in Iowa, the derecho which I never even knew what that was. My guest is Matt Bennett. He's a sharp dude. He's got a company called agmarket.net. He and I met several years ago uh, at a Channel Seed event where he and I were both speakers for the uh, event. And uh, he's been on this podcast before. So before we get to him, I want to remind you that this podcast, like so many before, has been brought to you by Harvest Profit. Harvest Profit is a software solution for your agricultural enterprise. Particularly if you are a farmer, you need software that helps your business be profitable. You've got to manage your inputs, your outputs. You know, farming is a business. Millions of dollars of capital in play every day. Why would you be doing this with a, a notebook pad, uh, you know, a seed corn tablet in your glove compartment? Use the right tools to make your business run like a business. Har HarvestProfit.com. Go there and tell them that I sent you. All right, Matt Bennett, thanks for being here. Talk to me. Well, I just uh, was still thinking about uh, whenever we were both in St. Louis and I spoke before you and uh, you basically roasted me for about 15 minutes of your hour. And uh, I think everyone thought it was quite entertaining. I was just telling you before we went on here that, uh, that I still catch crap about that. So uh, it must have left quite the impression on everybody. Yeah, Here, here's the thing for uh, listeners and viewers, now that we do this as a video as well as an audio, so we've got viewers to the Business of Agriculture podcast as well as listeners. So Matt's a sharp dude, and the thing is, you know, I've been on the circuit for a long time, and I'm, uh, a lot of times I was the follow-up. I was the ending person because I have the, the comedy background. So sometimes you spend a few minutes just sort of recapping. So after lunch, we had uh, Larry from the, you know, the university come in here and tell you this. And then usually it's almost like you can sort of surmise and wrap up the whole events uh, uh, present, presentations and do it in a funny way. So I kind of did that with you. I think I probably told the crowd. So basically what Matt Bennett with agmarket.net told you was, um, you're screwed. And then everybody laughs and see, it makes you look like uh, you're, you're, it makes you funnier. So anyway, you are funny. And, and certainly compared to the average grain commodities expert, you are funny. Uh, you also know what you're talking about. And that's why we got you here. USDA report comes out last week. We don't do a lot of corn and soybean charts here on this podcast because I figure you got that on your phone. But I think long term, there's some bigger trends here. We've been in a grain surplus environment for, well, most of the last hundred years, but it ebbs and flows a little bit. I thought we were sitting on a whole bunch of carryover, and then I heard that we we're going to have 53 bushel beans, and we're going to have 181 bushel corn. I about ran my truck off the road because I knew things were good, but I think the highest I ever remember corn being was like five or 10 bushels less than that. Am I right? Well, you know, we've been pushing up in the uh, above 175 a couple of times. 178.4, I believe, is where we ended up at uh, uh, 2018. But bottom line, you know, you've had some big crops in the last few years. Obviously, last year we took a little breather there. But, uh, you know, in the grand scheme of things, last year's yield 15 years ago would have been a huge yield. And so these genetics certainly have changed everything. But I'm like you. I saw the 53.3 and the 181.8. Those are the numbers that first jump out at you. Uh, but those two numbers combined with the carryout numbers for both corn and beans, uh, they were bearish. I mean, there's no other way to put it. They, they uh, versus trade expectations versus what people thought we were going to see, uh, those numbers were bigger. And, and so, uh, you know, your initial thought process is that, uh, you know, here we go with another bearish report, you know, it's going to be down and everyone's going to be frustrated and, uh, uh, it's going to be another uh, USDA is the worst people in the world type conversations online. Uh, but you turn around and by the end of the day, we're up. And so uh, uh, we've done nothing but go up ever since then. So that's what's crazy to me is that uh, you hear a big number. And I mean, I'm out here driving around the Midwest and I think, man, these crops are amazing. We, we needed a drink of water for about a week or two in June, early July, let's say. We were dry for sometime in June. Like, like, hey, man, we got a few tents. That's enough to get us by, but we need an inch. And then all of a sudden the rain started coming and we got cooler nights. 
So I'm like looking around saying, oh my God, we're gonna have such abundance. Bad thing is it's gonna drive prices down and prices were already at a point where they didn't need to be driven down because we're probably close to break even. But something crazy happened. Something crazy happened. 53 bushel, 181 bushel uh, are our predictions, which are high. And then all of a sudden prices are rising. What happened? Well, there's a couple of different things going on here. Okay, so first of all, you know, we got the, the, the storm event that, we're, that you want to talk about. I mean, we have to intertwine these because essentially you had uh, a storm, the derecho. I mean, heck, I thought it was a Derrico until I heard someone else say what it was. But, yeah, uh, yeah you know what? And they make up weather terms. I'm told that it's not a new term, but with the weather channel getting more and more like the mainstream media where they got to do flashy stuff, it started calling, you and I were kids in the Midwest, and they'd say, yeah, we're going to get a, we're gonna get some snow and some wind tonight. It wasn't winter storm Clarence. It was just, yeah, yeah we're going to get four to six inches of snow right. and maybe some wind. It, won't, it wasn't winter storm Mahilda. It was right. just, now everything has a name. And I thought, geez, that was Duratio a yeah. new thing? Is that a guy's name like Clarence, or is this an actual thing? I looked it up. I don't know, but all I know is that whenever that rolled through here on Monday, I mean, you know, every summer you see a few folks get, uh, you know, ravaged by a hailstorm or by blown down corn, and it stinks for them. I mean, uh, th that's all there is to it. I, I, I hate it for people, uh, but you typically don't see a storm that is big enough or catastrophic enough to have an impact on national yield. Uh, but whenever you have a storm like this with sustained winds of 80 to 100 miles an hour, three counties wide, uh, you know, there's no question that it, it's going to have an impact. And so, you know, you came into the report uh, with some uneasiness. And why would you be uneasy? Because the funds have this huge short position. So the big money players that are in, essentially investing in one side or the other of the market, those guys were short, you know, and, and I think there was some uneasiness. You come in with a 181.8, then the 181.8 giving you a carry out of 2.758 billion bushels actually – uh, if you'd have told most traders a 181.8 is going to come out to that carry, they would have said, hold on, how's come the carry isn't any bigger than that? The big reason is because the USDA is making some very large assumptions on demand. And so uh, I think the traders were looking at the pack carry outs weren't too bad. They were also wondering, what is the true impact of this storm? If it's 250 million bushels, then now your carry out's 2.5 because obviously the USDA, that was as of August 1st. It had the storm had nothing to do with their numbers last week. And so everyone was trying to handicap kind of, you know, where's this thing going to come in in the long run? And so that's a big reason why you ended up with a, a reaction that maybe we didn't think that we would see. It had a heck of a lot to do with the storm system and it had a lot to do with demand, uh, not to mention, uh, geez, Damien, we, we saw seven days in a row, including uh, last Thursday where the Chinese uh, had purchased U.S. soybeans. Uh, just a heck of a stretch. I mean, they've purchased so much from us, uh, not just beans either this year. It's typically just beans. Now they're purchasing beans and corn. And so, you know, the trade is trying to figure out, you know, how much are they going to end up purchasing? Uh, what's it going to do to exports in the long run? So USDA boosted exports last week, 75 million bushels on corn and beans. Again, that's something that traders looked at that probably gave them a little bit of pause on their negative thoughts as far as where the market was going to go. So a couple of things. So we got a lot of different folks that listen to the Business of Agriculture podcast. Let's say it's a person that sells, uh, sells, uh, you know, uh, dairy, dairy components. Uh, and they're going to say, I'm not a grain trader. I don't want to be overwhelmed. I'm too, I don't want to sound stupid. So I'm going to go ahead and help them out here. And um, remember, grain trading was never anything I wanted to do. Carry out. Tell the listener. And then we talk about uh, the number of bushels that carry over. So I want you to explain carry over and carry out, and uh, because that's a big thing. We've we've got huge numbers of corn that is from last year that's still unutilized, and that's where we say, oh, we got to make these sales to China or whatever to, be able to explain a few terms so that the average person that maybe you know maybe they they are in ag but they don't really know about grain brokerage. Right, and so you know essentially the USDA has a marketing year uh, for both corn and beans that starts September first. And of course, ends uh, the end of August, uh, the end of August. And so, uh, at the end of August, however much corn or beans that is projected to be on hand is what you call the carryout or the carryover. And so, essentially, uh, what they're saying is, coming into this marketing year, 
you know, we're going to have a little, uh, we're going to have maybe 500 and uh, some million bushels of beans and 2.2 billion bushels and change uh, of corn. Uh, whereas for next year, the, the projection for carryouts puts corn at 610 and, and 2.758 for corn. And so what they're saying is, is that, you know, we're going to produce a little bit more than what we use next year because the carryout's going to grow just a little bit. And so typically if the carryout's bigger, of course, supply and demand tells you with more supply available, uh, if the demand is constant, you know, that, that pricing might be a little easier with more supply, you know, it's going to move lower. And so carryout is essentially what you have on hand. How much do you have, uh, you know, if, some catastrophic event happened and we had no production this fall. How much do we have to live on for a while? And that's the carry out. I have a few friends that are not ag people that actually told me they like listening uh, to this podcast because it gives them sort of a big view of ag that's not just some media story about, oh, there, there's salmonella in the cauliflower or whatever. No, it's like big picture and then words like that. And as, you know, as I always think about, they use the word carry over, I get it, but they use the word carry out. I just can't stop of thinking about, okay, wait a minute. I got done working. I sweat it all day. I stop at the carry out and I pick me up a 12 pack of Coors Banquets. Oh, wait, wait, different thing. All right. So here's what we're really talking. We're talking about the leftovers. We're talking about what uh, stays around. We've generally, Matt, tried to manage from a USDA standpoint to have that because carry out really means you have, you have, just like my wife's putting green beans up right now, it means you have uh, you have canned vegetables in the cellar and you're not going to starve. But is 2.7 billion bushels too many green beans in the cellar? You know, so 2.758 billion is what the USDA is saying at the end of this next marketing year. So what we're getting ready to harvest, they're saying that uh, we're going to still have that much on hand uh, September 1st of 2021. Uh, is that too much to have on hand? Uh, that is one of the largest carryouts we've ever seen. I mean, basically the only time you saw bigger carryouts than that was back in the old government storage days. So back in the 80s, the government was storing corn. Uh, you know, they were in the program of storing corn. Uh, we had a lot of corn around, uh, you know, and, and that's what they call those, the government storage days. That's whenever I was a kid. Uh, it was a long time ago. But bottom line, that's the last time we had to carry out like this. But we're using more corn. If we're going to be first off, first off Matt, not as long a time ago for me. Secondly, yes, I point out that uh, I, I remember the '80s when they had the payment in kind program, the PIC program, and what that does that paid farmers in corn not to plant corn. So that way, the idea was they were double burning through it. You weren't getting the production, and you paid them with corn to get rid of it. A couple of things though, because I always think about uh, you know how the media does numerators or the not denominators. 170,000 people have died of coronavirus. It sounds like a big, bad number, except that 8,000 people die every day in the United States of America. So, you know, run the numbers. On a numerator denominator basis, 2.75, 2.76 billion bushels of corn is a lot of corn. But for the average person that says, well, how does that compare? We're going to harvest about 14 billion bushels this year, 15? Yeah, around 15 billion bushels, uh, depending on which estimate you're using, but let's just call it 15 billion bushels. And so, you know, so we're keeping, we're keeping back about, what is that? About 10 to 15%, 15% of our, uh, of our crop that will not get used and we'll have in the, in the cellar. Right. Yeah. You're basically going to have, uh, you know, between one and two months, you know, of corn, uh, essentially to be able to, to live off of, uh, you know, if you have a late harvest or whatnot, I mean, we've come into that before, especially with the, in the case of soybeans. So several years uh, in the not so distant uh, past, we've actually had carryouts on soybeans, 100 to 200 million bushels, which is extremely tight. You know, that's a stocks to use ratio. I mean, that's another way to put it is that you have stocks and then what's the usage? And so the stocks to use ratio for corn and beans right now is what you would call adequate. Uh, it's not necessarily, I'd say corn's probably more burdensome, uh, you know, but it's not tight. Anytime you have a tight stock to use ratio, you're using so much compared to what you've got on hand that prices are going to typically rally. That's not what we see right now. And that's part of the reason why prices have been depressed this summer. Uh, yes, we've got a little uh, bump here lately, but you know, that's something that your ag people that are listening, you know, we probably ought to talk about a little bit is you know, what do you do whenever you've got a rally on bearish information, especially if you're in my part of the world or your part of the world 
where guys are guys and gals are thinking they're going to have the best soybean crop they've ever had. People keep asking me, well, how much more is the market going up? And you say, stop worrying about that and lock in profit and sell, 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 right? Because there's that thing that happens. And whether you're an ag or not, whoever's listening to this podcast, you know what ag people do? Just like everybody. Well, I'm not going to sell my mutual funds now. I said, I thought you were going to get out. Yeah, but they're, 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 they're going to go up. It's going to keep going. And then once they drop 5%, oh my God, I got to sell. Or worse yet, they drop 25% and then they sell and say, but you were all excited when they were when you thought they had 25% to go up. And now you think they're, same thing. So you told your people, because agmarket.net is in the business of helping people make money, farmers make money. You said, still worrying about how much more this is going to go up. We just got, got news that we have a record crop and and prices rallied, I'd sell. You told them to sell? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the thing that you gotta, you got to look at is, uh, for instance, I know people that are looking at $9 and below beans as far as a cash price. I mean, you've got November beans right now above nine. But most people in your part of the world, my part of the world, aren't going to get nine because of the basis. You know, so uh, what, is a, what does the person that you're taking your beans to pay you? Uh, and they don't pay you what the Board of Trade price is. They pay you something beneath that. Most Dear listener, if you're not a commodities person, the difference between what you hear that the CME or the Chicago Board of Traders was once called uh, quotes or you hear on the talk radio and what a person actually gets when they haul a truckload of soybeans or corn or wheat or anything into the local elevator, the difference in that is called the basis. Okay. okay. And, and the so, reason the basis is there is because? Right. Yeah. I mean, because there, there's, a, there's a fee for everything. So it's trucking. Uh, you name it. So location. So you're going to get better prices typically on the river, on the Mississippi River, than what you're going to get in Decatur, Illinois. Why? Because that's the export market. Uh, sometimes Decatur's bidding close, uh, but bottom line is, uh, you know, you've got to, if you're not using the beans right there in Decatur, then you're going to have to ship them over to the river, most likely for the export market. But uh, what I'm trying to say, though, is this. Producers are like, well, 880 beans. I don't like 880 beans. I've been selling beans for nine to ten dollars for quite some time, and I'll say, you know what? Well, let's just take a look at what your yield is this year, uh, because your yield times the price. That's what pays the bills. So, you know, we have a we have a software as well that we use with producers. I mean, I think putting your stuff on the computer, having it in black and white, knowing where your break evens are, is extremely important. And so, with that being said, typical producer in my part of the world. 65 is a is a average production history you know over the last 10 years so on soybean 65 bushel APH uh, if you take that 65 and make it 75 so you know typically I say project what your APH is to be conservative you know whenever you're trying to do your budgets and your APH, cash flow APH APH average production history so what is the 10 year history what is the 10 year average uh, for your uh, history as far as yields are concerned so if a 65 APH, if that is your average, uh, and you bump that up to 75, uh, because you think you're gonna have 75 bushel beans this year, uh, most producers in that situation, using the numbers we use and the calculator we use, that drops your break even price by $1 per bushel, okay? And so there's a lot of producers in central Illinois that have a 65 APH, feel like they're gonna have 75, 80 bushel beans. And so, you know what, if the prices are 50 cents lower than what you typically like to see or the, what you had in your head that you wanted to see, hey, let's take a little bit of a reality check here and find out that we're a dollar to a dollar 50 better off than what we would have been because of the yield. Yeah, so uh, it's the old thing of you're, you're getting less per bushel, but you're getting more bushels and that's, uh, you know, it still comes down to dollars per acre. He talked about software. So, uh, I want to remind you that the Business of Agriculture podcast is brought to you by my good friend, Nick Horeb. He's a Fargo guy. It doesn't matter who he is. He has customers in 26 states, four provinces. People from all over North America work with him and use his products. He set out to build a software solution that can help farms and agricultural enterprises be more profitable. You can go to harvestprofit.com and sign up for a free 14-day trial. Tell them Damian Mason sent you. More importantly, just check out their stuff because it's a good product and help you run your business. Okay, so here's the thing. Long term, we are making a lot of bushels. Um, you said that USDA is predicting that we're going to use more of those bushels. Now, the one thing that people get prickly with me about, Matt, is I said, you keep thinking that tariffs and trade wars with China are why we have cheaper soybeans. I said, there's also the element of we got a lot of soybeans. 
Brazil makes a lot of soybeans. Argentina makes a lot of soybeans. China themselves make soybeans. Other countries make soybeans. We got a global market. There's a lot of stuff. We're not the only ones with bushels of carryout. Are we going to just still have, we, we have too much stuff. Is it going to be this way for the next five years? That's a wonderful question, but you got to ask yourself, what are you going to do whenever Brazil's bringing more uh, soybean acreage every year? Pretty much, you know, I mean, they're able to expand. Uh, they've got uh, ground down there that they can develop and expand into farm ground uh, that they're allowed to do so. I eat really bulldoze the rainforest or go out to, they have some prairie type areas some grasslands areas and they, right. they carve those up too. Yeah, it's not necessarily the rainforest, you know, but I think they call it a Cerrado or something. Uh, some of the ground that, you know, basically they're just uh, leveling things off. And, and I've had producers down in that part of the world tell me that first year they planted beans and made 50 bushels. I mean, this is on ground they've never produced on. But, uh, you know, more importantly, uh, you got to remember, uh, when, why are they doing such a thing? Well, with the currency difference between the dollar and the real, uh, Brazilian producers the last two or three years have been printing money. I mean, there's no question about it. Uh, my friends in South America, they would verify this. I mean, I was at the Farm Futures Conference speaking this winter, and uh, I met a very large scale producer. And, and this producer uh, was talking on a panel, Max Armstrong was moderating it. And Max said, you know what, what were your gross revenues for this past year? And the producer said, uh, it was like 250 million. Okay, it was a pretty substantial amount, but they, these guys farmed 350,000 acres. Yeah. And, and Max said, okay, I'd like to know, the, and the people listening to this, they want to know what your net revenue is. What's your profit margin? The guy said 33%. <laughs> you don't hear very many people in the U.S. with a 33% yeah. profit margin. So, so, he, so he only made $80 million last year after only made. Yeah. So I asked him about it afterwards. You know, I just asked him about his operation. But, you know, it, it's phenomenal what's going on down there, uh, especially with the currency situation where it's at. Now, the U.S. dollar has continued to dip the last uh, few weeks. That is a real boon for us. And it's part of the reason our exports really had an uptick. And the dollar really looks vulnerable to more selling. And I'll tell you what, if the dollar would break through some of these support levels, we might get in a situation where all of a sudden we're looking at our commodity prices and saying, why are we rallying? Well, part of the reason why we be rallying is because the dollar has made our exports so cheap that we can get them out on the world market competitively. And, and we start to drop our carryouts. The other thing, you know, I don't want to get too far into the weeds, but uh, inflation is something we all need to keep a very close eye on. You know, I mean, a uh, man of your means, Damien, you probably got all kinds of gold and silver laying around. I mean, look at what gold and silver's done lately. It's just amazing. But those are inflationary pressures that could spill over to the grain. We, we at least got to hope we see a little bit of that. First off, I do think we're going to have inflationary pressure. And explain to our listener why inflationary pressure uh, helps grain. Well, you know, if you do have inflation, then that means that uh, commodities are, are, in, are essentially gaining value, okay? And so the silver market, for instance, in the last three to four weeks went from $18 to $28. Uh, you know, you look at silver at $28 an ounce, you're like, big deal. Gold was $2,000 an ounce. But whenever you almost doubled the price, I mean, that, that was quite a move. Uh, and it, it, if you see anything even close to those percentage moves, that we've seen in gold and silver, then uh, certainly you would see some of our ag commodities benefit greatly. Now, sometimes inflation doesn't affect our ag commodities near like you, know, you see, for instance, in currency or crude oil, uh, some of the other things that we talk about. Uh, but any of that whatsoever leaking into the grains, even if you get a five or 10% inflationary move, that would be something that producers would certainly love to see. I do believe we're going to ha have inflation. I said it on this very podcast uh, a few weeks ago, when the government is giving people money to watch Wheel of Fortune and um, money becomes worth less. If you can get paid uh, $1,000 a week, depending on between the state and the federal, for a unskilled, uneducated uh, waitress in Michigan, and I'm not being mean, I've waited tables, so don't pull that. I'm just saying when you when you make it so that person is being paid to to do nothing, um, money becomes worth less. Uh, food jumped almost 6% between March and the end of May. Food sometimes can be the leading indicator on inflation. So I think inflationary pressure is going to be there. By the way, then what's that mean for all of agriculture? If we got inflation, your real estate is okay, right? Yeah. 
Absolutely. Uh, your commodities, your commodities maybe don't go up as much as gold and silver, but your commodities go up a little bit. Uh, yeah. Is inflation good for ag or bad for ag? Uh, it just depends, but I think it's good for ag. Now, a lot of times whenever you see inflation get a little bit carried away, I mean, obviously you can see interest rates start to change a little bit. I just don't think that we're in the position here in the U.S. where we can increase interest rates much. I think it, we would absolutely uh, break the back of the economy. And so I think that you're pretty safe in assuming interest rates are probably going to stay stable. I don't think they're going to go up much. But in my opinion, inflation would be good for most producers. I think that what you're going to see is you're going to see a little bit more money in their pocket. And what they've seen, for instance, in South America, like I was just talking about with, with this cheap real is that those guys have been able to make money they never thought that they could make due to the way that the, the way that they're able to buy their uh, products, first of all. Second of all, sell their products on the world market. They've just made a ton of money down there. The last well, their currency, their cur it's because of their currency being low valued. Speaking of inflation, um, one thing and then interest rates, yes. Uh, a lot of folks listen to this understand that some people probably don't. High interest rates definitely will be a really bad thing for the business of agriculture. Um, you know, we got some people that are pretty levered. They can obligate an operating loan because you do have millions of dollars of capital at risk. If your operating loan is hanging around 4%, you're probably okay. When you start talking about putting that at 8%, uh, it gets a little, little skinnier. So you don't see interest rates raising. I don't, and I'll tell you why I don't. The United States government is now at $27 billion, trillion dollars of debt, and they just took on six of that trillion here in the last six months. They can't obligate their debt if the interest rates go up. That's the reason I don't think it'll happen. Do you got any other thoughts? No, I mean, I totally agree. I mean, there's no, no question. That's why I said it'd break, break the back of the U.S. economy. I mean, we've just been printing money and giving out money and, you know, anybody gets a little bit of money. And, and, and so uh, if someone listens to this will say, what about the farmer? And uh, there is no question that the farmer has gotten some money from MFP1, MFP2. Uh, these, these were the programs uh, that essentially we put into place to help the producer because we were into it with China you know, over these uh, tariffs and the trade war, just to explain that a little bit. But uh, most of the producers that I talk to, if not every one, will tell you that they wish they didn't have to get any sort of MFP or outside government help if the government would stay out of the business of agriculture. So I just want to clear that up because producers, uh, are they relying right now on some help from the government? Yeah, I think so. And uh, part of it's because the government has screwed up our export program and they've been in the business of agriculture at times when they didn't need to have their nose in the business of agriculture. And you're, you're absolutely dead on right. Now, I would still counter that uh, we were going to have low commodity prices, whether we got into a spat with China or not, because the globe has a whole bunch of, whole bunch of crops sitting around in, uh, in, in it's, there's a lot of crops sitting around. Okay, his name's Matt Bennett. He's going to give us his final prediction and outlook because he's a smart dude. His company is agmarket.net. If you want to know how to, how to make more money, if you want to do business with him, how do they find you? Yeah, I mean, just agmarket.net. So that's part of the reason why we, we chose that name. Just go there on the web. I mean, we've got some really cool tools and great research. Uh, we do like a Monday afternoon webinar that's been wildly popular. Uh, we're basically, me and my other three uh, teammates, weigh in on what we think the markets are going to do. But, you know, as far as a, what do I think is going to happen moving forward, I think that we all need to pay very close attention to what happens uh, here in the next few weeks. Obviously, this is going to be a very large crop, uh, but don't get wrapped up in where the market's going to go. Worry about what you're going to do as far as paying bills. I mean, if you've got a huge bean crop, sell some beans. If you want to stay in ownership, uh, buy yourself a call option or do something that, that there, there's very limited risk and you know how much you're paying. Uh, but bottom line is don't get too many eggs in one side of either side of the equation unless it's locking in profit. I think that that is business advice for anybody, whether you're in farming or any level of agriculture or any level of business period, you should lock in profit when you can. And, uh, you know, it's a, pigs get fattened and hogs get slaughtered. Sometimes it's better just to be a piggy piggy that gets fattened and just take what you can take. So go to agmarket.net. He's also active on social media. I don't really like Twitter that much, but I hang out there because I have to because I got a bunch of ag people. He's there. About every Easter, he takes a picture of his family. He's got a good-looking family. Um, I don't know where. It, obviously, the wife's got some good genetics. It's because of my wife, I can assure you. That. <laughs> so, uh, 
the, the uh, book of Food Fear is uh, still flying off the shelf. Um, I'm selling a bunch of these here today. If you are a listener and you like the Business of Agriculture podcast, make sure you pick up your copy of Food Fear. It's on audiobook, ebook, and hard copy at DamianMason.com. Uh, reminder that this episode of the Business of Agriculture is brought to you by my good friends at Harvest Profit. Harvest Profit is a software solution that can help your ag enterprise manage your ag enterprise like the business that it is. Check them out for a 14-day free trial at harvestprofit.com and say hello to Nick Horb. Matt Bennett, agmarket.net, what else you got for us? Is that it? Call you up, figure out how to do business. I'm excited about this harvest, I can tell you that. And I think that, uh, you know, hopefully we'll get uh, this economy or the, the everything opened up here one of these days. Maybe you and I can uh, share the same stage again one of the, uh, sometimes so you can make fun of me once again. I'm, I'm ready. You know what? I won't even make fun of you. I'll be so grateful to be back out to hitting the road. All right. Thanks for being here, Mr. Bennett. And uh, do indeed check out his company because he knows what he's talking about. Till next time. Thanks for joining me here, man. And until next time. This